يشرفني ويسعدني أن أدير هذه الجلسة أنا صقر النور باحث في ال. We have two speakers today. First, by Professor Hamid Dabashi, who is a professor at comparative literature and Iranian studies at Columbia Universities, and he has many publications to his name. Uh, um, Professor Dabashi will uh, present uh, under the title Where in the World is Palestine, which is a journey to think on the ethical, material, and the imaginative uh, tour of Palestine and Palestinians. In it, he will be talking about literature, cinema, and uh, uh, also uh, about Palestine and Palestinians. The second intervention will be Dr. Michaela Sahar. Uh, she, she teaches at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Dr. Michaela Sahar is a research interest focus on the settlers' identities in Israel and uh, Australia and the comparison between different forms of uh, settler colonialism. Today she will be presenting on the return of the native indigenity, settler colonialism, and the multiple ironies in Israeli-Australian uh, commemorative narrative of the Palestine campaign. And uh, she will be recalling the uh, Australia, some parts of Australia's history World War II and the struggle of inventing and reinventing identities. We have one hour and 15 minutes for this session. We will give each speaker 25 minutes max so that we can have some time for the questions and uh, answers afterwards. We start with Dr. Hamid Dabashi. شكرا جزيلا لك سيد رئيس الجلسة آمل أنكم تستطيعون سماع even virtually to be on the I campus. I dearly miss my friends and colleagues in Arab Center and in Doha Institute. Uh, uh, many of them among my dearest and closest friends and colleagues and comrades. First, I want to thank, of course, Hani, Hani Abwad, who has been in touch with me uh, for a long time. Uh, to facilitate my participation in this extraordinary volume of Omran, to which I contributed this uh, piece, and all other colleagues in, uh, in the Arab Center. My friends and colleagues in the Doha Institute, uh, they all know who they are, Ayman, Ismail, Elizabeth, uh, Eid Atif, I dearly miss them. I wish I could be there as soon as uh, possible. But let me cut to the chase. My time is limited and share with you the uh, uh, context and the impetus behind the essay that uh, the Arabic translations of which, wonderful capable translation of which now appears in the special issue of Omran 
to which I have given the title, Where in the World is Palestine? Uh, the impetus, initial impetus for this talk, for this uh, essay, began with a review of Timothy Brennan's recent book on Edward Said, uh, in which uh, the, the reviewer in Cairo Review uh, said, uh, takes a strong objection to Edward Said being considered a New York intellectual and in which he argues that Edward Said was in fact a world intellectual, belonged to the world. Uh, when I read that review, my initial reaction was, well, why are these two, two things exclusive? Why should Edward Said not be considered both a New York intellectual and a world intellectual? But to me, above all, a Palestinian intellectual. I want to put aside the question of what a exactly is intellectual is a whole different issue, but it is the context, the world in which a thinker like Edward Said or anyone else, Ilan Pape, Mahmoud Namdani, Azmi Bashara, they are located. Where are they located? Uh, location is, uh, is the issue, as in fact, the title of Timothy Brennan's book suggests places of the mind, places. Uh, it is in this context that suddenly the question of Palestine, the site of Palestine, became integral to my thinking about uh, the idea of the world, the central concept of the world, a dunya, uh, becomes a, an issue. As it appears in concepts or categories or ideas such as world philosophy or world cinema or world literature. How exactly, where exactly is this world? As I have argued extensively, for example, about the idea of world literature, it is an idea that was initially inaugurated in the mind of a German thinker, wonderful, prominent German thinker, Goethe, and he called it Weltliteratur. But at the same time, uh, or almost the same time, other German uh, thinkers were thinking of world history, uh, to which some agreed and some did not uh, agree. So the idea of where exactly is this world, what are these parameters, have been uh, integral to my thinking of the last decade or so. But in this essay in particular, I begin by asking, if we talk about world literature, where exactly is Palestine in that world literature or world cinema when we talk about Palestinian cinema? I share with my reader for the first time about 30 years ago when I began to teach aspects of Arab cinema, including Palestinian cinema. And I went to uh, Edward Said, Allah Yerhamhu, uh, to see if we can have helped me to put together uh, sources. And the first thing he said, what do you mean Palestinian cinema? There is no Palestinian cinema. And then to the, towards the end, he, he will always say, you invented it. The question is more than anecdotal. The question is, what would happen to the idea of the world as we use it in world literature, world cinema, world philosophy? If a Palestinian filmmaker or literary artist or uh, filmic, uh, philosopher, thinker, intellectual enters into that world, because of the colonized condition of being a Palestinian, that uh, generates an epistemological problem. Epistemological problem to talk about anything worldly when Palestine and when Palestinian as a Palestinian cannot be part of that world by virtue of its what is called uh, present absentee, both being present and being absent. It is predicated on that premise that I began to think that we have to, instead of beginning with the world and asking where Palestine is in that world, we have to begin with the site of the Palestinian predicament, with the condition of Nakba, uh, with the condition of dispossession, with the condition of uh, reality of Palestine as Palestine is, refugees and uh, 
and second rate citizens and, and uh, etc. in their own homeland. That paradox must be the beginning point of our thinking about uh, the world, the world around Palestine, not the other way around. We have to shift the, the analytical. Here, I began to review in my own mind manners in which my own conception of Palestine over the last half a century has evolved. And it came to a figure, a particularly important figure for me, whose name, whose nom de guerre, nom de guerre is Abu Said. So from Said, I went to Abu Said. Now, who is Abu Said? In, uh, Early 2000, I was part of a group of Palestinian and Lebanese activists, comrades, that we were working in uh, Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon and in Syria. One day, I will tell this anecdote and then make a theoretical conclusion. One day, Mervat um, uh, Abu Khalil, a dear friend who is also associated with the Arab Center, we were walking out of Sabra and Shatila she said to me, so you're Iranian? I said, yes. And she said, there is an Abu Said you have to meet. I said, who is Abu Said? They said, he, he is with Jeff Shabi. And uh, he lives in Mar Elias, a camp in, in Beirut. So we get in the cab and we went to uh, Mar Elias. And uh, uh, one thing led to another is a wonderful story. I have written it. Uh, finally, I meet this young man uh, who is introduced to me as Abu Said. We look each other in the eye, but, and we both immediately realize we're Iranian. Not only we're Iranian, we come from the same region. We are both from the Southern Iran. That he, he was a couple of years younger than me. He went to high school very close to mine, etc., etc. But after high school, I went to college. He went to military service, after which he went to Germany. In Germany, he joined the Bad Bader Meinhof. And 1982, when the Israelis invade Lebanon, uh, uh, this person known as Abu Said, uh, with his friends, get on a car, travel from Germany to Syria, from Syria, smuggle themselves into Lebanon, join Jebel Shabia, go to the south, and start fighting. So one day in Beirut, he and I get on a bus. And we are traveling with uh, uh, Mervat and other friends. We are driving up to uh, Baddawi camp. And I asked him, uh, you're Iranian, Abu Said, you're, what is your name? He said, my name is Behruz. Uh, he said, I hear you're a Zoroastrian. We didn't have any Zoroastrian uh, in the South. He said, my name is Behruz. But when I came here, they told me I have to choose a nom de guerre. And he was fascinated by an Iranian poet who was just executed in Iran, Saeed Sultanpur. So I told him, my name is Saeed. He said, no, here you can't be just Saeed, you have to be Abu Said. I said, okay, I'm Abu Said. Uh, I said, but Zoroastrian, we don't have, we didn't have Zoroastrian in South. He said, well, in Lebanon, everybody is known as a Sunni and a Shia and a, this and a that. I didn't, I'm a Marxist-Leninist. I don't want to be part of any of these things. So I looked around to see what is it that they never heard of. So I said, I'm a Zoroastrian. So they would leave me alone. Now, if you look at my book on uh, Palestinian cinema, the book that I edited, it is dedicated to this Abu Said. Now, the figure of Abu Said became seminal to me as someone who is a combination of sentiments globally from Iran to Europe, to the Arab world to become a towering figure in Jebel Shabiyya. When we entered Badawi camp, for example, they were all coming and welcoming him and embracing him and touching his shoes and such. Then the question becomes a body of sentiments, a world of sentiments and ideas that are beyond solidarity and friendship and political commitment. It is actually a world. One of the spots that uh, Abu Said and uh, the late Samar Hadris and uh, Mervat uh, and others we visited in Mar Elias was the center that Ani Kanafani, the late uh, Kanafani's widow, was running for children. We spent some time in there. 
cut about 20 years later, uh, I met an Italian artist, Mario Rizzi, who, uh, who lives in, in uh, uh, Berlin. And uh, I'm very uh, interested in his work. And he was asking me for an idea of a documentary. And I gave, her the, I gave him the idea of uh, uh, Ani Kanafani. And he went to Beirut and subsequently to uh, Europe and made a, a extraordinary film about uh, both Hassan Kanafani and Ani Kanafani. And the film was, the clip has been shown in European context. My point is, if you pull all of these stories, which are lived experience of just one person, but lived experience of a person located and committed to the Palestinian cause, a certain body of sentiments and realities and totalities and fragments emerge that is no longer limited to the idea of commitment, but it is rooted in the reality of Palestine from which a different world emerges. Two seminal thinkers, I know I'm running out of time, so I will cut to the chase. Two seminal thinkers are crucial in my thinking about this notion of where in the world is Palestine. One is the French Marxist uh, philosopher, Henri Lefebvre, and his notion of uh, the social production of a space, uh, but for me, I transfer, tra uh, uh, translate his notion of a space into world. And in his categorization, physical, imaginative, et cetera, one space that is missing is ideological space. The ideological space that I address uh, in my most recent book coming out, uh, Islam After the West, uh, the, the, the illusion of Islam and the West, which reminds me to thank Ilan, who is there, Ilan generously endorsed it, that if we take the idea of the West out, then what would happen to Islam outside this binary? So this space, this ideological space, the West and the rest, is one thing that is missing, whereas for me is quintessential to definition of ideas of world literature, world cinema, world philosophy, that are predicated on the ideological spacing of the West and the rest. The next second equally important thinker in my mind is Nasr Hamad Abu Zayd, particularly in his uh, seminal text, An Nas As Sulta Al Haqira, a text, power or governance, power and uh, truth, in which again I translate Nasr Muhammad's. A hermeneutic proposition into the text of uh, 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 Palestine, Palestine as a text, and how the notions of sulta here, colonial, settler colonial domination, could, uh, disfigures our understanding of, of Palestine, whereas the truth is predicated on the fragments of which I gave some examples, that if we put them together in a kind of a allegorical Benjaminian way, a different reality emerges upon which the necessity of theorization of Palestine beyond East, West, North, South, etc., becomes possible. I think I did my talk within the limited 15 minutes for which I'm grateful, but I'm here in case you wish to talk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Shukran jazeelan, Dr. Hamid. Sanaud ilayka fil atnaa al-munaqasha. Al-an, Dr. Sahar, al-kalma alayka. So I want to start, as everyone has, by thanking um, the Institute and Omran um, uh, for inviting me and for publishing my article. But I also wanted to say that I'm here really as the result of um, solidarity work occurring between Australian Palestinian people, the community of which I'm a part of, and 
Aboriginal First Nations people um, in Australia and the fact that we had a, a conference in 2019 um, which resulted in a publication with Magazine 28 in Gaza and, um, and this is how I became um, included, I suppose, in this Omran special issue. Um, and I think I want to touch today at the end of my talk on the importance of this kind of um, emergent narrative, if you like, or um, narratives that elide um, a rejection of or a um, resisting against settler colonial narrative, although it's not the main focus of my talk. In my article, I also talk a little bit theoretically about why I'm coming to my issues um, or why I specifically look at the Palestine campaign in the way that I do. But I feel like many of the theorists I quote have actually been here at this symposium and Ilan does not need to hear me quote Ilan and Nadim does not need to hear me quote Nadim. Um, and so I make no claims to being a great thinker. What I can offer you is a case study of um, a particular dynamic in Australian-Israeli relations in, in two parts. And in this way, I want to situate my talk with um, something Ilan was talking about yesterday, which was the tension between legality and legitimacy. And I think um, Israel and its relationship to Australia is dealing with this tension between legality and legitimacy by aligning itself both with the institutions of the settler state and by aligning itself with the Aboriginal Australian community through which it attempts to derive a kind of legitimacy or indeed an associative indigeneity. And that's really the case study that I'll, I'll talk about today. This morning also, Lorenzo was talking about um, creating or shaping the imagining of um, crucial constituencies. And I think actually um, at least uh, coming to this through an Australian-Palestinian activist lens as well as through a scholarly lens, um, there's an important alliance to be made here. I don't really mean it as a solidarity. I mean it very much as a shared struggle, at least in the somewhat embattled um, settler colony of Australia. Because there is a cultural capital which, for reasons which I can't necessarily talk about today, um, Australian First Nations people in the 21st century, um, and earlier, I don't want to say that this struggle is not ongoing, it is. Um, their cultural capital in Australia is on the ascent, and so there's a natural alliance there between Palestinians and First Nations people in Australia, um, which really works towards discrediting um, Israel's aspirations to legitimacy through a kind of associative claim uh, to indigeneity through, through what I call in this paper indigenous diplomacy. Uh, just for the translator, um, I, when I d describe uh, certain First Nations or Australian Aboriginal activists, I will, where appropriate, use um, their, their own identification. So there are, maybe people know this, but there are, uh, we're over 500 First Nations in Australia and most people identify themselves through specific national groups. So my apologies to the translator if that becomes a problem. So this paper investigates an example of a broader phenomenon in Israeli cultural diplomacy by examining in particular the development in the 21st century of a connection between Israel and members of the Australian Aboriginal community. I argue that this highlights what I call Israel's indigenous diplomacy, which retroactively attempts to locate the Zionist state project as an indigenous one. This seems to make two related claims about the nature of Israel, that the Zionist state project is legitimated not merely ancestrally, but rather claims for itself the inherent and inalienable rights elsewhere claimed by indigenous people to land. And that consequently, the characterization of Israel as settler colonial is not only inaccurate, but perverse. Indeed, some uh, Israelis have paradoxically attempted to invert the settler colonial paradigm to claim that it is Israelis who have suffered from the oppression of settler colonialism. 
The process has been characterised in the context of Native American and Israeli relations as redwashing, as coined by Native Hawaiian scholar J. Keilani Kawanui, and might be extrapolated as blackwashing in Australian First Nations context, for example. Um, also, uh, I think my translation suggests that I would be talking about World War II. Actually, I'll be talking about World War I. Um, the, the centennial of the Battle of Beersheba in 2017 and its joint commemoration in Israel by Australian and Israeli dignitaries is not the first example of either the celebration of anachronistic linkages between the two settler nations, nor of Israel's fostering of links with Aboriginal Australian communities. Indeed, the 21st century has seen an uptick in state-level relations based on nostalgic and inaccurate connections between Australia and the geography of various World War I campaigns in which the Anzacs played a part, and the Anzacs are the Australian New Zealand Army Corps. They're particularly significant since the 1980s in Australian uh, collective psyche and national identity. Um, I'm not sure they're quite so significant in New Zealand. Um, Similarly, in the 21st century, there has been new interest expressed by Australian Jewry and Israel in fostering links with the Aboriginal Australian community, something that has been sponsored by private organisations um, like the Australian privately funded Pratt Foundation um, and the Jewish National Fund, with which I imagine people are familiar. But the centennial of World War I, and specifically the Palestine campaign in 1917, marked an explicit turning point in the incorporation and fostering of Israel's relations with Australian Aboriginal communities via official state channels. It perhaps goes without saying in this audience, although not plainly to the event organisers the Beersheba Centennial, that the event was deeply anachronistic. The Israeli flag was prominent in the reenacted light horse charge of Beersheba and New, Ze New Zealand representatives performed a traditional Maori haka. The Maori people are the people indigenous to New Zealand, and the slightly dark uh, photograph on the right is of a, uh, of a Maori haka. It should be noted also that at this particular centennial event, the New Zealand Prime Minister, who Israeli media had anticipated would, in would attend, did not attend. Um, there was a, a very particular reason for that at the time to do with um, uh, New Zealand's vote on an annexation um, in the UN. But it's also, I think, beyond that, um, an interesting contrast in the legitimacy that New Zealand is prepared to offer Israel through such ceremonial occasions. Um, some would be aware, notwithstanding, that New Zealand is its own uh, settler colony and has its own settler colonial history, that it's done considerably more work to redress the history in respect of its treatment of its First Nation Maori population. The reenactment clearly illustrates what Vanessa Agnew has described as an ethically unencumbered event, which by association made representations about Israel's Indigenous sovereignty and imposed also, as was demonstrated in the speech of Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who was in attendance, a retrospective teleology on the significance of the campaign for both the creation of Israel and relations between Israel and Australia. This is apparent when Turnbull says, and I quote, and this is also on the slide, had the Ottoman rule in Palestine and Syria not been overthrown by the Australians and the New Zealanders, the Balfour Declaration would have been empty words. It is in these ceremonial occasions that we see expression of Edward Said's characterization of Zionism in the question of Palestine, that the Israeli state project has sought to instantiate a claim of Jewish indigeneity in the land, which is a key aspect of indigenous notions of sovereignty, and in so doing, as Patrick Wolfe theorized, has worked to eliminate the native. Yet further to this, as Kao Nui has argued, we see now in Israel inversions of the settler colonial paradigm, the ambition to eliminate the Palestinian native as native. In the long lead up to the centennial commemorations of World War I in Australia, and particularly of the Gallipoli campaign, which is in, uh, known in Australia as uh, the baptism of fire, referring to um, Federation is in 1901, but the Australian nation does not really bind together until this uh, moment, the Gallipoli campaign, and which has contributed to the centrality that the Middle Eastern theatre of war has come to have in Australian commemorative practice, the Australian Post, in conjunction with the Israel Postal Company, released a joint commemorative stamp issue in May 2013. 
The stamp issue was intended to reinforce a contemporary identification between Israel and Australia at an institutional level, a strategy which affirms and corroborates each state's founding myths and origin stories. In the souvenir leaf to the issue, for example, Israel's ambassador to Australia, Yuval Rotem, asserts the symbolic value of the issue in affirming this relationship. And I quote from the leaf, despite great geographical distance between our two nations, we operate on the same foundation of values. I am proud of all that our countries have achieved together and genuinely excited by the prospect the future offers. Rotem remarks on the commonality between the states, which is illustrative too of the commonalities in settler mythologies of conquest, in enunciating what he sees as the basis of identification. And in so doing, he invokes a permutation of the now surely discredited argument made by settlers of their environmental prowess. And to quote again, we both inhabit ancient lands and yet are relatively young nations. We know the true value of water and have made our deserts flourish. I think it's important to acknowledge here that in affirming the connection between Israel and Australia, the value is not all on Israel's side. Australian historian Henry Reynolds argues that the militarization of Australian history has been a counter-revolution in Australian historiography, which has been by far the most successful campaign in the culture wars, in part because it, was not, it has not been seen for what it actually was. And maybe for those who are not aware of <laughs> Uh, arguments that happened in Australia. Um, the culture wars was really uh, a kind of turn of the 21st century um, battle actually between historians in particular about how we saw um, Aboriginal history vis-a-vis -vis colonial history. The Australian obsession with the Anzac campaign of World War I has rather obscured an historical record of the frontier wars, the frontier wars being uh, wars that Reynolds describes as continuing for 140 years, really the ongoing resistance of different First Nations against the colonial uh, entity. Replacing in-country violence, the frontier wars, in-country violence, with the fiction uh, which is perpetuated in Australia that no wars have ever been fought on Australian soil. While the revival of the Battle of Beersheba signals in both an Australian and Israeli context a falsification of the historical record and the complicity of settler colonial states in corroborating the, natural, the national fictions of each other, something that emphasises the hegemony of nationalist histories, there is also a versatility of the Anzac uh, and Anzac tradition in Australia, which has enabled a, ser a serial of... Uh, enabled serial transitions in the iconography of the Anzac. As Graham Seal argues, the Anzac captures the political military imperative of successive national government, but also a kind of folkloric stereotype of the, the digger, the Australian soldier. As such, the Anzac has a role in both top-down histories, uh, character, characterised by official state commemorative practices, as well as in grassroots traditions, something Seal notes is a hallmark of Australian culture that has an ability to hold ambivalent, even contradictory, perceptions together. This is what Caroline Holbrook argues helps to explain the Australian lack of intellectual curiosity about Anzac, our enthusiastic participation in its rituals, and our sensitivity to its exploitation or disparagement. Indeed, in Australian scholarship, the reasons for the omission of the Palestinian ca campaign until relatively recently in Australian commemorative practice have been variously speculated on. Paul Daly, for example, has argued that one likely explanation for the omission of the Battle of Beersheba from Anzac celebration might be attributed to the December 1918 Surafend massacre and its aftermath. Um, again, in a nutshell, and I don't know... Um, if people know of the Syrophen massacre, or if it's just our own national shame, but um, it, uh, Australian and, and New Zealand soldiers slaughtered all the men in the village of Syrophen, uh, apparently in a retaliatory act, so their story goes. In which he suggests that Field Marshal Allenby's response in apportioning blame to the Australians, unreasonably in Daly's view, worked to diminish knowledge or memory, both in Australia and elsewhere, of the Australian role in the Palestine campaign. Specifically, Daly points to Allenby's withdrawal of recommendations for the decoration of Australian soldiers and both omissions of their role or outright disparagement of it in official and officially reported speeches. 
Military historian Jean Beau has theorized that the historic neglect bears on the relative insignificance of the campaign in contributing to the goals of defeating Germany. While Peter Manning's study on the Australian media reporting of the Palestine campaign in one particular Australian paper of note um, suggests that the issue was to do with the fact that the paper didn't send an Australian reporter to Palestine until late uh, 1918, prior to which it had relied on a British correspondent and from which one might extrapolate that the reporting on the Australian role in Australia was somewhat neglected also at the relevant period. Yet the neglect is not only tied to the ignominy of Surafend or the relative insignificance of the campaign's achievements in the context of the war, but also it would seem on the fortunes of military commemoration and the position of Anzac mythology in Australian national culture over the last half century. As Holbrook and Keir Reeves argue, a new form of Anzac mythology emerged during the 1980s as a result of politics particular to the country, which redefined the Anzac image and which has influenced also a redefinition of the Australian national character. They argue that until this time, even the more prominent Gallipoli campaign was largely overlooked and public attitude towards Anzac mythology in the 1960s and 70s was one of hostility and apathy. This is affirmed in the recollection of director Peter Weir, um, perhaps famous, although this shows my age, uh, to an international audience for films like Dead Poets Society, but whose film Gallipoli did much to revive this disaster in the national consciousness and which has been embedded in Australian sc national school curriculum um, for Year 9 students for nearly 40 years, featuring a young Mel Gibson um, at the start of his successful Hollywood career. Yet Weir recalls that on his visit to Anzac Cove in 1976, the place was practically deserted. Anzac mythology has metamorphosed yet again in recent years when in 2015 on the centennial anniversary of Gallipoli, the Australian government sought for the first time to incorporate Indigenous servicemen explicitly um, into state commemorative events. This marked an historic shift in federal attitudes to explicit acknowledgement of Indigenous ex-service people. Joan Beaumont shows that the absence of explicit recognition of Indigenous service people has been framed around a prohibition to identify outside um, of collective military units or to march in explicitly Indigenous ex-service groups, thus leading to the Coloured Diggers March in Sydney's Red Firm since 2007, and this was the 11th... Uh, uh, dig uh, coloured diggers march um, in Redfern. Redfern is also a significant uh, suburb in terms of Aboriginal politics in Australia. Um, it was a site, so in 1992, the Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating made a famous speech there known as the Redfern speech. Um, which is widely acknowledged today as having, some, uh, having come closer than any other Australian Prime Minister in acknowledging the widespread dispossession of Aboriginal people at the hands of British colonisation, um, including the ongoing effects of that colonisation into the present. Yet, uh, as Philippa Scarlett observes, the Anzac legend has been a malleable one and recent integration of the role of Indigenous servicemen is testament to the legend's plasticity, which Scarlett argues has facilitated the incorporation of Aboriginal war service into the current incarnation of the Anzac myth. She cautions, however, that this achievement has resulted from a misrepresentation of the context and circumstances relating to mateship um, in the wartime and post-war experience of Aboriginal servicemen, mateship being a sort of central plank of the Anzac identity in Australia. Similarly, a decade after its opening, the Australian Soldiers Park in Israel has become a site of incorporating the history of Australian Aboriginal servicemen into the Anzac legend and the Palestine campaign specifically, and it now forms a key aspect of Israel's engagement with the memory of this campaign. This connection is not without precedent. And I will say very briefly that the key engagement between Australian Jewry, Israel and Australia, the Australian Aboriginal community had previously centred in the 21st century on the recuperation of the story of William, William Cooper pictured here in this slide um, and as uncovered by the Gumbain Gear historian Gary Foley who led a delegation known as the Australian Aborigines League to the steps of the German consulate in Melbourne in December 1938 to protest the treatment of um, the Jews in Kristallnacht. Uh, Michaela, 
three minutes to wrap up? Sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump through that commemorative story, um, interesting though it is, other than to briefly say that ultimately the grandson of William Cooper um, was invited by the JNF to um, a memorial tree planting in the Martyrs, uh, the Forest of the Martyrs in Jerusalem, um, which he accepted the invitation to do so, and um, uh, he 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 planted these trees with uh, land from his own country and um, and water from from Yorta Yorta land. So in 2017, the centenary of the Battle of Beersheba and other battles of the Palestinian campaign, um, Aboriginal soldiers for the first time led the national um, marches uh, in Australia and the JNF organised um, a 10-day long commemorative program in, uh, which featured uh, these descendants, these Aboriginal servicemen. It was also funded by a trust known as the Roman, Rona Tramby Trust from which um, a documentary was made and filmed on uh, free-to-air television in Australia. Um, one of the reasons why there were so many Aboriginal service people um, in the Palestine campaign specifically is as a result of various legislative changes to the Defence Act in Australia combined with the fact that conscription was not compulsory after long debate in Australia and so... Um, recruitment basically turned a blind eye to Aboriginal recruitment. Um, consequently, many Aboriginal servicemen ended up in Australia. The documentary makes the argument, and this kind of comparative indigenising uh, argument, if you like, that um, Aboriginal uh, service people fought in the war in order to prosecute their own cause back in Australia. Um, this is... Uh, illustrated by this particular uh, person featured in the video, um, a Gunditch Mara person from uh, an area, um, Daragwarung country, which is famous for a war called the Umarala War, um, one of the frontier wars. Um, and so the documentary, effectively, this is a, um, a, a wealthy Jewish uh, uh, documentary making um, enterprise, which is associatively uh, recuperating um, a connection between uh, Indigenous solidarity, between um, what uh, what World War One effectively um, is doing, as Turnbull says, to liberate um, Jewish lands, I suppose, with um, this particular um, frontier war. Since 2017, um, further efforts of Israel in this um, war of Indigenous di diplomacy have included the unveiling of a statue in uh, Samak titled The Aborigine and His Horse. And it's worth noting here also that in Australia, Aborigine is a racial epithet. Um, and yet this is a statue, uh, na but not only named this, but dedicated to the, um, to the Aborigine soldiers who fell in World War I. The statue uh, both reinforces the work of Israel in eradicating its Palestinian ghosts while foregrounding a new positionality between Israel and Australia in which Israel is seen to champion histories of Aboriginal servicemen against a context of the Australian settler state's erasure of that history, which I am not attempting to defend. This has enabled the all but disappearance of Palestine from the eponymously titled Palestine Campaign, although one that continues to haunt the Australian War Memorial, which houses the 6th century Shalal Mosaic, um, now somewhat obscured from the public in the Hall of Valour, and which was expropriated by um, the Australian Anzacs in World War I from Palestine um, and, and taken to Australia and made central to its War Memorial. The key part of that War Memorial now pictured on the right... Um, the Hall of Memory is clearly inspired by the Shalal Mosaic, but no doubt due to the embarrassment of both the colonial expropriation of the mosaic, um, but also the um, beleaguered question of where Palestine is in the Palestine campaign, given the relationship between Australia and Israel. Um, if you have a look at this mosaic on the War Memorial uh, website, it says that it's in fact inspired by um, Italian Byzantine mosaics and not by the this mosaic, which is downstairs and which you can see from colours and etc., is almost certainly the inspiration. <laughs> 
Yet for all this funding, monument making and commemorative practice, at least in Australia, there is little doubt about what solidarities offer genuine amplification and meaningful allyship. In Australia, an important piece of political activism to prosecute the claims of First Nations people in Australia was the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in 1972, pictured at the top. And as one of its architects, Gary Foley, notes, as aliens in our own land, uh, we should have an embassy like all the other aliens, except our embassy will reflect the reality of Aboriginal living conditions. It will be a tent on the lawns of Parliament House. More recently, Camilla Royata's Richard Bell transported this idea of the Aboriginal tent embassy to Jerusalem at the 8th uh, Jerusalem Art Show at El Mamel. Um, since through myriad legal uh, fictions, Palestinians like Aboriginal Australians have been made alien in, their, in our own lands. In 2020, when a group of Palestinians attempted to publish an open letter on Australia's rejection of the United Nations Human Rights Commission uh, resolution against annexation, uh, there was not one paper that would carry the letter, citing despite over 700 prominent signatories, a lack of public interest that would carry the letter, notwithstanding over 700 signatories to that letter. A lack of public interest, um, and for which was ultimately crowdfunded, um, the cost of a half-page advertisement in the weekend paper to secure the rights of free speech. In this, it was prominent First Nations scholars, writers and artists who did not hesitate to put their names to a letter about which others prevaricated on account of their reputation. I'm just in my last paragraph. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Similarly, after May 2021, when Australia's progressive weekly publication, The Saturday Paper, refused to publish a single piece about Palestinians during the Unity Intifada, or indeed by Palestinians in the Uni Unity Intifada, um, it was First Nations people who joined with Palestinian writers, scholars and poets to produce the Sunday Paper. As Darumbal and South Sea Islander writer Amy McGuire notes in her piece in the first issue, for Aboriginal people looking at Palestine, this is not complex. Sovereignty is at the heart of both of our protests. Again, earlier this year, Palestinians asked artists to withdraw from the International Sydney Festival in response to Israeli government sponsorship of the event. And it was again First Nations comrades who heeded our call and at no small cost to themselves withdrew prominently and early, catalyzing the success of the boycott. In short, I do not believe that there is any amount of funding that can convince First Nations people involved in lateral grassroots activism with Palestinians that there is any sense in which Israel is like them. Thank you very much. Um, آه الآن نفتح الجلسة للنقاش والمداخلات آه نأخذ ثلاث أسئلة. We'll take two questions, three questions. Wonderful talks. And hi, Hamid. If you're still there, we miss you too. Uh, Michaela, I am fascinated by the talk. In fact, I had no idea. I just learned all sorts of new things that are astounding. And they reflect this uh, 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 <clears throat> trend of, of co settler colonial powers attempt at rewriting or inventing a complete history that they have nothing to do with, more or less. <clears throat> uh, on the Israeli side, it's, you know, I mean, what does Israel have to do with World War I? I mean, physically, I mean, in Palestine. Neither the number of Jews, native Jews of Palestine, or Jews who lived in Palestine at that time, and we know that during World War I, there was a migration of Jews out of Palestine. We know that the numbers were minuscule. Of course, David Ben-Gurion himself served in the Ottoman army, but only a handful. Uh, we know that the campaign in Beersheba was led by prominent Ottoman officers and many conscripts from throughout Bilad sham Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Transjordan, etc. And, and the Gallipoli campaign, one element that's always missing from any discussion of Gallipoli campaign is the fact that the majority of the uh, 
soldiers in Gallipoli were actually from the Arab territories of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans usually uh, sent people outside of their areas to fight. So Turks will be sent to Palestine and, or, or Syria or, or Sinai or anywhere else, and Arabs from Bilad sham or Syria, the greater Syria, will be sent to the, either the Dardanelles or to the uh, Russian fronts. And my very own grandfather fought in the, in the Gallipoli, and as a result, I know of a number of people who went to the graves there looking for their missing, this is after a century, of course, of their missing grandparents or... Uh, and of course, my outrage has been always that the Turks forgotten that element. And it becomes only, of course, because Mustafa Kemal was the, the, the officer who led the campaign, that it becomes like this great Turkish victory, completely forgetting the Arab element. But now, to see that the Zionists now are celebrating as if they are part or contributed in any sort of sense. I mean, it's one thing to invent a biblical history. And, uh, you know, it's not one thing, but it's, we've gotten used to that somehow. <clears throat> and there is some element of that, that yes, there is a biblical history, whether it's connected with the current Jewish immigrants or not, that's another story. But to, to, to rob an important part of the history that relates to World War I, 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 I mean, <clears throat> I'm outraged, but I, I, I really thank you for bringing to light this topic that needs to be highlighted more. One last thing, it's so sad to know that Sarafand had a major massacre in 1917 <clears throat> and another in 1948. And in the memory of Palestinians my age, at least, who grew up in Palestine, Sarafand is a name associated with a notorious prison. Uh, so the only reference other than historical reference is, you know, where is so-and-so, he's in Sarafan, sen sentenced to 20 years or something like this. Thank you. Thank you. Mudakhalat uh, ukhra aw ta'aliq aw as'ila. If anyone have questions, uh, comments. Uh, okay, Sahar, you can you can replay or re you have to you want to do to, to say something about uh, this change or Oh, no, I mean, I would love to have a conversation with you about this. Is, um, and actually, you've raised so many interesting parallels here. I mean, actually, with Gallipoli, but you probably know, um, I've never um, looked at it from the, from the side of the Turks, and I didn't know that, it was, that the Turks had sent, really, the Arabs to fight. But similarly, Gallipoli was a, um, very much to uh, take care of a British landing, and it's the Australians who were sent over the over the trenches and, and largely to their deaths. Um, and in, in this way, I suppose they're both caught as victims of um, empire, actually, um, prosecuting wars on behalf of other others. Um, the Syrophan massacre, actually, a few years ago, it was not possible to really find much out about it, other than that um, when I first started thinking about why is it that the Palestine... So in Australia, actually, to give people some context, Every town hall has a World War I memorial and Palestine is written on it. And as a young Palestinian kid, I mean, this is quite exciting. You know you're from Palestine. You see these war memorials, they say Palestine. Um, and yet I never really knew why or how, you know, the Australian Anzacs had been in Palestine because although this is on the memorials, it's also evacuated from... Uh, from the military, the military commemorative culture or military, military history until very recently. And certainly the argument that, I mean, when you dig into these things, of course, there's more than one reason. 
But when people started to really reflect after about 20 years on why it was that Anzac had sort of um, created a new national identity from the 80s onwards, it was felt that it had probably been omitted because of Surafen, but it was always a footnote. It was quite difficult to find much out about, yeah. But thank you, and there's many things to talk about. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I, I may, be, uh, if Hamid is always with us, I may ask, not, not a question, but uh, when I read the paper, I read it in Arabic, um, uh, and it, it was very interesting to, to, to thinking about uh, where is Palestine, and now I understand more clearly that you start from your own uh, personal reflection about it, but you, you end actually with a very, uh, very ideological, as you say, but also very uh, international way of thinking of Palestine because we cannot think the world as it is uh, without, we cannot think on Palestine without rethinking the world or reshape the world, if I understand very well. Um, but I, I find it's more focused on literature, which is which is, which is interesting, but even when we talk about Ghassan Kanafani, we talk more about Ghassan and his family, not about his... He creates a lot of persons, a, a lot of uh, p f Palestinians, everyday life, uh, uh, migration inside Palestine, outside Palestine. I think this is more or less mess in your uh, intervention. I mean, the Palestinians, uh, the ordinary between the ordinary Palestinians are not very well uh, visible, in, in, in maybe because of your way of choosing to present your own experience. But it, it, it could be interesting to, to elaborate on this, on this, if you want, of course. Uh, can you hear me, Saker? Uh, yes, very well. Thank you, Saker, for your question. Uh, First of all, I think all ordinary Palestinians are extraordinary Palestinians. The whole point is to transform and denormalize uh, the condition of settler colonialism. Uh, because if we talk about normal Palestinians or ordinary Palestinians, then the condition of coloniality and the uh, uh, particular issue of settler colonialism becomes ordinary and normative. The question is entirely reverse it. But you're absolutely correct that I do emphasize some iconic figures in my work, uh, such as Bassan Kanafani. But I have not uh, iconized these figures. Uh, they have become iconic in the context of uh, Palestinian struggles. That is, uh, using your words, ordinary Palestinians have turned people like Hassan Kanafani into iconic figures. Now, this does not mean that the day-to-day -day resistance of Palestinians is not integral to our understanding of uh, what I mean by turning the table around rather than beginning with the idea of the world and then coming to Palestine. Because if we begin with the idea of Palestine, the uh, idea of the world, which is, as I said, in, in the case of my spin to Lefebvre, uh, is an ideological space. Uh, when we talk about world cinema, world literature, world philosophy, this is an ideological uh, world in which you cannot locate, because of the dispossession of Palestinians, you cannot locate Palestinians. Uh, here, in the back of my mind, is the idea of uh, the Argentinian uh, philosopher, uh, Enrique Dussel, that before we have the condition of uh, ego cogito, this is Dussel, ego cogito, we have the condition of what Dussel calls ego conquero ego conquero, uh, 
the reason, I mean, I share uh, some Nassar's outrage uh, that uh, any spot that the Israelis find, they go and say, oh, yes, we are, we are there. Namely, they, from, uh, you know, the expression, shoot while crying. While they are in the position of power to slaughter uh, populations of Palestinians, they all also identify as victims. Uh, these are ideological spaces. If we are to reverse that ideological space is to begin with the factual lived experiences, at least since Nakba, but you can trace it even before Nakba, lived experiences of Palestinians that demand and exact a different kind of understanding of the world. In that process, you're correct that uh, people like me and not just me, we pick and choose on iconic figures that Palestinians have turned into icons. But the lived ordinary experiences of Palestinians, which is itself extraordinary, is quintessential in our theorization, beginning of theorization of the idea of Palestine as the epicenter, as the gushing wound from which then the, the rest of the idea of the world must emerge. So I do see your point, Sarker. However, I think that, uh, we should not talk about ordinary Palestinians because that in and of itself is an extraordinary fact. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. I think now we, uh, there is a, هناك كلمة ختامية من اللجنة المنظمة. فنرفع الجلسة وشكرا شكرا لكم. نعطي القلب مش عارف مين. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, before we conclude uh, this symposium, I would like to invite Dr. Mahmoud Mamdani for some kind of final remarks or final thoughts uh, that uh, you may have on the on the presentations or presentations only, not the presentations that have been discussed in the last uh, two days. Please. I'm looking at him. <laughs> I remember seeing a movie long time ago where there's the expression that you are made an offer you dare not resist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so my time has arrived. <laughs> I have been made an offer I cannot resist. So it's, it's an honor to be made such an offer, right? Not everybody can be made such an offer at any time. Um, We've thinned out. Uh, the most resilient have survived. Uh, or we planned our time better. And we dedicated this time to, uh, to this particular gathering. Whatever it is. Uh, we used to have an expression in Uganda after the end of the Civil War. Uh, when you met one another in the street, you would say, well survived. <laughs> Not that there has been a civil war here, no. Uh, I think it's been a, it's been a, a, a very productive um, deliberation, set of conversations, um, bringing together a, a diverse group of people, um, young and not so young. Um, and the young mainly those who have focused on 
very particular issues. Uh, sometimes uh, drawing from their own doctoral work. So it's not only particular, but it's also intensive. Uh, it's also an attempt to uh, uh, kind of explore the world in a raindrop. Um, and the what I call the not so young, or let me say just plainly older, older scholars like myself, many others around the room, uh, who uh, who've tended to take a more comparative approach uh, to look at the uh, the broader world. Um, but I think all are faced. Uh, all of us have been faced with a common challenge, uh, which is. Uh, how do we think Palestine? Uh, how, how do we think? How do we frame Palestine? What, what does the experience, Palestine, mean to us? Sure, settler colonialism. But how do we think Palestine? Uh, how do we locate it in our lives, in the world in which we live? Uh, in the experiences through which we have come to where we are. Uh, so that no matter how particular it forces us to broaden, and no matter how general it forces us to focus. Right? So we're, both sides are, are challenged. Um, and as the language these days goes, it's a very productive challenge. Academics uh, usually come through disciplinary formations. Uh, historians amongst us are used to a very particular focus. It's an event. Historians are the home of area studies. Right? Historians tend to shun theory. Uh, they tend to be distrustful of comparisons. Um, and if I was to pick an opposite, I would say sociologists uh, try to embrace the whole world to, to produce general theories, uh, to make claims to universalization. Um, and we've had a share of both uh, in, this, in this conference uh, to our enrichment. Uh, but th at the same time, each type of presentation has generated uh, its own set of responses. Um, I'll give you an example. So, settler colonialism. Um, you have the settler who doesn't exist alone. There is the native, the settler native. It's a relationship, right? Does everybody fit into this? Of course not, right? Uh, is the whole world made up of people who were at some point natives and at other point settlers? I don't think so. Uh, settler and native is a very modern relationship. I think it's born of the modern period. Um, sure, there were immigrants. Immigration movement, mobility, has been characteristic of humanity. We've all been told that humanity began in Africa, right, millions of years ago, and moved out, moved out around the world from Africa. But migrants are not settlers, and migrants are not natives, right? Migrants, migrants, migrants move. So the aspiration to turn settler native into a universal uh, paradigm 
uh, something that should caution us, I think. Uh, if, if there was a world before settler colonialism and settler native, we can hope for a world after it. If there wasn't a world before, then maybe it's a utopian dream to think of a world after it. How we view where we came from will also have some say on where we're going to. Uh, I want to comment on a couple of papers just very, very briefly, but not to say that, of course, it's a risk because you're not commenting on other, other papers but just by way of illustrating what I'm talking about, which is that we've been discussing more than ju just what we've been discussing. Okay, it, it opens up. It opens up a larger territory. So I think of uh, Nadim, Nadim's paper. I don't know where Nadim, Nadim Rohana. Not here. Yeah, so. Um, even I have a meeting, but I've been, I had, I've been detained here by the powers of the provost, who, who is an old friend of mine, which is the only reason I can talk to him like that, because I knew him before he was provost. <laughs> so, so Nadim's, um, I mean, I thought, I thought Nadim's paper was interesting, because Nadim is, uh, is, is talking of... Uh, of a very particular ideology uh, of the Zionist movement, a religious ideology. Uh, and he is talking of, uh, he, he sort of starts with the qu uh, question, how come uh, there could not be an Israel in Uganda or in Argentina uh, or in uh, wherever else? Why did it have to be Palestine? Uh, and, and, and of course he presents us with a, with a, with a sort of set of facts, which is the, even though this Zionist movement had a secular leadership, it couldn't think of a Palestine except of, a, of an Israel, except in a religiously framed piece of land. Why? Because that's the only way it could expect to rally some kind of a following behind this project. Um, Fine, and that happened, and now, of course, we've come full circle uh, to a marginalization of this secular labor Zionism. Um, and uh, one would almost think Zionism followers and leaders are all necessarily religious. Um, but that's the thought that, that Nadim's paper brought out in my mind. Um, Now, of course, there, were, there, were, there, were, there was a, a, there were those of us who tried to sort of compare, touch many bases, and there were those who focused very much on Palestine. And I'm just going to make one more comment. Um, Ilan Pape. Right? Um, now, Ilan Pape gave us this distinction between legality and legitimacy. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting uh, distinction today. Um, I want to suggest to you that we, we have seen over the last few years a, a remarkable erosion of the legitimacy of the Zionist project in the Western world. Not in the whole world but in the Western world, America, Europe. Um, and it's directly connected with this revelation for so many that the Zionist project is not unique. It's an apartheid project, right? Um, and, and, and it's a sea change, in my view, in terms of, in terms of uh, popular consciousness. Um, and for this kind of audience, which is people who write, who communicate, it's a huge opportunity. 
It's an opportunity of which each of us should individually become cognizant, first of all, and then make use of it. Make use of it. Um, it has got the uh, a, a sort of the stormtroopers of Zionism in the intellectual world on the back foot, on the defensive. Right. Um, so if this conference can at least get us to uh, to marshal our energies uh, to to not take the conference as an end, but just as a step along a larger journey, would have been a great success. I thank our our uh, hosts. Uh, I thank the organizers. I thank uh, those who are always behind the scene, who one doesn't even know, uh, even if one stays here the whole time, um, some of whom we know. Um, but I thank all those on behalf of all of us, really. I mean, I've just had the opportunity. I just had the opportunity of being here, but I thank them on behalf of all of us. Um, shukran jazeelan.